Hello, good evening and good morning to everyone. I welcome you all to the second class in BASAS certification program from Edureka. I am Nitin, your instructor. Uh, a very warm welcome to everyone. I would like to know if everybody has set up the SAS studio or has procured access to the WPS system because you will require some system to get the hands on on the project as well as the codes that we give in the assignments and in case you have any issues uh, I would strongly encourage you to log a ticket with the support team they'll get back to you pretty quickly and it will be fixed in no time so make use of that feature uh, reach out to people as much as you want yeah Hema you are right uh, you will require the virtualization BIOS setting because on a 64-bit machine you will download a virtual machine uh, which will help you connect to the SAS University Edition so I hope everyone has done it because without that it won't work you will need the virtualization BIOS setting as well I think it is uh, mentioned in the set uh, in the PDF guide and people who don't have a 64-bit machine uh, they can use the world programming system interface which currently I'm using you can run your course there see how it works follow all the concepts get your queries resolved and later on move on to the PC SAS or SAS University Edition as you wish okay so uh, I think we should get started now uh, I'll quickly recapitulate what we discussed yesterday and I'll set the stage for uh, this session uh, again as I discussed yesterday we'll be having breaks after every 30 or 40 minutes for a fi for five minutes in which you can stretch and uh, kind of get re-energized and get back to the session and uh, if you have any questions shoot them in the question window and uh, I'll be happy to take them up okay so yesterday uh, we had discussed about how to bring the data into the SAS system okay which is of prime importance because unless you have the data in the SAS system or the SAS software you cannot work on it so we discussed uh, some techniques as to how we can use the data lines or how, can, how we can import a flat file or delimited file or other a Microsoft Access database and uh, and other variations and bring the data into the SAS system so today we'll be deep deep diving into the functions that are available in SAS the features of the data set the other options available and this class will be kind of grilling from a technical standpoint uh, it will be an interactive session as we had yesterday it, there was a very good response from everyone everyone and I hope it continues today as well okay and uh, if you if you get stuck on any concept uh, you can direct your questions I'll be immediately answering them if they are absolutely relevant and I need to answer them right now if the topic will be discussed later on I'll park them and I'll take them up when the topic will be discussed okay so today's session will revolve around working with data in SAS right so this was the breakup and today's session will be working with data in SAS so at the end of this class you will be able to understand how do you use the numeric functions which are available in SAS that means the functions which work on numeric type of data how do you use the functions which work on the character type of data how do you work with SAS dates how do you use the formats in SAS the in formats how do you use the put and input functions you know functions so any special cases we will take them up conditional operation using if then if then else else if how do you use the SAS data set options SAS data set has various options available which you can use to slice and dice and filter the data okay so let's begin with the numeric functions available in SAS that means the functions which will work on the numeric data so number any number you have in uh, your data your function can be applied on that number okay so a simple expression like arithmetic operator might not be suitable for some complex operation or transformation you're looking at so there are predefined inbuilt functions available in SAS very like the other programming languages as well which you can directly use plug them plug the values into the, the in from your data into those functions and receive the results so uh, on a broad level if I split all the functions that are available in SAS you have functions which work on character type of values 
probability functions, date and time functions, random number generators, financial functions, simple st sample statistics functions, macros are available to do an entire uh, piece of programming for you. So you can just pull, call the macro, pass your data to it and it will give you the results. State and zip code functions. So there are functions available which will work directly on the zip code. Uh, there was a need for it. So SAS provided a function of that sort. Mathematical functions uh, like sine, cos, tan, log and various mathematical functions. Okay. So, so in, like we have the in formats and most of the things in SAS, the functions are also broadly classified into three types. So you'll have numeric functions uh, fun working on the number type of data, character functions will work on the character type of data, and date functions which will work on dates. So now you must be thinking, oh, he's, I told you that date is nothing but stored as a number, so why can't we use numeric functions on top of dates? So date is absolutely stored as a number, that is true, but the way you add two numbers, Okay, and the interpretation of that result is different than what the way you add two dates and interpretation of those two dates. Okay, so there is some difference in the way you interpret the results. Hence, the storage is the only thing which is common between date and numbers, but the interpretation of the result and the way the functions are applied is different. So it is classified into a separate category altogether. It has been provided as a new category. So under the numeric functions, We'll have a look at some of these functions which are there um, in front of you. So some of them are pretty intuitive. You can have a look at the function name and understand what should be the result of it. For example, if you say int and then pass the number to it, whatever is the integer portion of that argument will be returned as a result. This is a very common function in most of the programming languages and is uh, the same in SAS as well. If you have to find out the natural logarithm, which is ln in maths, Natural logarithm means to the base E. So you say LOG and you pass the number to it, you'll get the natural logarithm back. If you want to calculate the logarithm to base 10, you'll use log 10. Now, guys, the important thing to understand is this list is non-exhaustive. This list can never be exhaustive. Can you, can you tell me the reason why the list of functions, say, working on, um, that we apply on numbers in SAS is non-exhaustive? I mean, why can't I say, okay, these are the 500 or 600 odd functions and this is it? Can, can you tell me why I cannot say with certainty that, okay, this is the list, this is the exhaustive list, these will be the functions, okay? So the reason is as the demand comes up, as the requirement comes up, new functions get devised. So how do they get devised, how do, do they get developed and how are they uh, provided in the uh, SAS versions is how the SAS upgrades itself. So there was, there was SAS 7, SAS 8, SAS 9. So what I'm trying to tell is the versions of SAS as and when they are upgraded, new functions, new functionalities, new approach, new macros are clubbed together and provided to the uh, end user. So you can never say with certainty these, these are the functions and they, are, they will still remain the same. There are no more functions added in the system. There will always be a possibility because the need of the R will dem will decide if a new function needs to be added. So this is a non-exhaustive list and it will keep on growing depending upon what you need out of it. So uh, if you want to go and have a look at all the functions working on the number type of data in SAS, you can go ahead, go to sas.com, go to the knowledge base of sas.com, follow the version that you're looking at. Uh, if your uh, SAS studio is SAS 9.3, you will follow, you should follow the all the documentation that is available for SAS 9.3 because they have documentation for SAS 9.2, SAS 9.0, SAS 9.4. So the, the system that you're using, you should always follow the documentation pertaining to that system because there might be subtle differences, there might be something that, that has changed over the different versions of your SAS software, okay? So I'll show you some of codes that we'll execute together and uh, I'll show you how it works. So Kiran has a question uh, whether it is different for different versions. So uh, on a high level, the functions which are kind of very straightforward, intuitive, which don't need any variations with time, they are they behave the same in different versions. But if there are functions which needed to be uh, to have additional facility or additional features, they'll be kept the same, but a new function will be devised to handle that facility as well, you know, just to keep it uh, 
clear and so that the end user doesn't get confused. What I'm trying to say is, suppose the, the round function used to round to one place of decimal. Suppose, it, uh, I'll tell you in detail what round does, but let's hypothetically assume that the round function used to round the, the figure that you provided it to one place of decimal. So what if you want to the user to say, I want to round it off to say second place of decimal, third place of decimal. So now this is an additional feature that the user is requesting from this function and is expecting from the SAS system to provide. So they won't change the round function per se, but they'll provide a new round function, say round overall or round user, whatever the name is. And it will accept an argument from the user that I want to round it off so to second place of decimal to third place of decimal. So this is how it is. The, the functions that are carried on from version to version will remain intact, but a new function with additional features will be provided in the upgraded versions, okay? So uh, I'll show you some numeric functions and we'll start with our uh, WPS console. I hope now you're pretty much comfortable with this console and I think some of you might be logged, might have also logged into this console, tinkered around it, just seen the interface. So right now I have maximized the interface. That means I'll have the code window, the log window, and the result window in front of me. Okay. So this gives me more real space on the screen and I can view the code, change the code, see the result and do it much more easily than what it would appear uh, earlier. So how do you do that? You just double click on this window, say the editor window. Okay, so it comes back to its original uh, interface, but if you want to match it, just double click it, it will come to be the maximized version. Okay, so uh, I'll keep on switching between different data sets, but I'll uh, share beforehand what data set I'm using. I'll, I'll tell you what data set I'm using. So I, if, if you uh, find it hard to relate to what data set I'm using, I'll uh, share the contents of it. And I'll also share the in the insurance claims loss file that I was discussing yesterday, I'll ask the Adirika guys to share that with you so that you can kind of get started with some sample data, do some analysis on it. So I'll use the input loss data set, which I created yesterday. I'll create a new data set and so on and so forth. I'll use, I'll use a lot of data line statement to create some dummy data and then work on it. So I'll create my first data set right here. So it is the same one we are importing, we are, uh, using the data line statement to import the name, skill, the stint of the person. The stint means what amount of time he worked in company one, company two, company three, what is his date of birth, okay? So the best practice is go to the log and see if everything is fine. So I ran some piece of code earlier. So what I'll do is I'll clear this log again and I'll run this code again. So you can use this green button. You can click on it. It'll run, the, it'll submit the code on the WPS server hosted on this IP and bring back the results. You can see the progress out here. Once it is done, it will stop. The progress bar will stop and you can see the result out here. Okay, so this data lines, data has been imported into SAS. It is available as a SAS data set called my first data. So guys, is this a temporary data set or a permanent data set? Yes, Hema, you are right. Kiran, uh, can you tell me, is it a permanent data set or a temporary data set? Okay, so we had discussed this yesterday. This is a permanent data set. No, Kiran, this is not a temporary data set. The reason is I've already defined a library reference called OUTPT to this physical space on the WPS server. So the moment you have a pointer to a physical space, you, you are able to point to a physical space on any location. If it's, a, if it's a local machine, remote server or anything, your data set gets stored there. Okay, it is always available for you to work on it. It is not that if you close this session and you terminate this, it, the data set will be gone. It happens only when I did not have a first level of referencing for this data set. If this was gone and I had just data, my first data, this would have been a temporary data set, okay? So we'll quickly see the results, it's fine. So I'll, I'll show you how the operations are performed. So see carefully guys what I'm trying to do in this piece of code. I'm setting my input data set which is the one that I've created here. Okay. And I'm creating a new data set called my math funk. And it is stored in the same physical location which is referred to by this library reference. Okay. And then what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to calculate the mean of 
these three stints okay and there is a, a special statement that I put in it's called put mean stint is equal to what I what I'll do is I'll show you in a short while so let me run this okay so it has executed it's still running so I'll first show you what this put statement is doing so this put statement if applied in a SAS data set I mean in a SAS data step so this is a data step right anything between a data and a run is a data step if this put statement is applied and this is a, a format or a syntax which you give to instruct the SAS system that I want the value of the variable mean stint to be printed out to the log now there are some keywords which have different interpretations in different contexts. put is one of them put is used in variety of scenarios in SAS and you have to be careful where you are using it and how the output will appear okay so if I say put means stint it will throw out the values in the SAS log so this was the SAS log this was the data step that was executed okay and what it has done is it has calculated the mean for stint 1, stint 2, stint 3 and stored it in a value for mean stint for each of the observations right for each of the observations so if I print it out So after executing this data step, you must realize that a new variable called mean stint should get created, right? And the value of that mean stint should be the mean of these three values. So see how, how it has worked out. So if I if I've written something to the log, it will be written to the log and not, not to the output data set. So did you see this difference? if I have commented out the put statement it got written to the output data set yes so the point I'm trying to make and what I'll try to uh, do as frequently as possible in the entire session is I'll keep on making such tweaks and changes and I want you to come back to me and ask oh, why isn't why is it working like this why is the output something different we expected this so these are the subtleties and nuances that SAS has which people often fail to catch and especially if you are looking at certifications at uh, becoming expert champion programmers in SAS you should always keep a close eye on what is happening what is the output coming up what is the log looking like is it as per your expectation so this is all very important I had the put statement here and the output did not contain the variable that should have been created in this data step okay I'll, I'll show you again for those who fail to uh, notice this I have put a mean statement a put statement here which will print the mean stint value to the log but not to the output data set so I'll print this again okay and have a look at the HTML results so this HTML results means the output any output that gets created you're printing out something so the output okay I hope everybody is now comfortable with the proc print step guys proc print is like second nature in SAS I, I don't know if I, how many times I use proc print in a day but uh, there is there is no uh, procedure as useful and as handy as proc print proc print immediately shows you what your data set contains what is the value and what is the pro what is the problem okay so it has not revised it and it will if I comment it out it will print out the values of all the data of all the variables from the input data set as well as the output data set
So, so it should it should be the uh, part of the output data set. Uh, there is some issue in this. I think the output is not getting refreshed. I'm not sure, but it should come up. So Hema, it should come up in the output data set as well. But there is some issue in the in the refreshing of this uh, output screen. Let me run this once more. So it should the variable should be created because no matter what we are printing this to, but the variable did get created out here and it should be present in the output data set. Let me run this once again. And let us see the output. So the execution is finished. Yeah, it, it, it is coming up. There was some refreshing problem in the screen, so it was not coming up, but it should contain. So to answer your question, Hema, put will write the op value of the variable to the log, but it won't alter the way input data set variables are written to the PDV and then finally to the output data set. So it should not uh, stop any variable from moving from the input data set to the output data set. Okay. Any, any questions around this, guys? Is this clear? So why have you why have I shared the put statement here? Because suppose you're just doing some calculation here and you want only few variables. Uh, you want to check on the few variables uh, as to what are those what are the values of those variables. You can quickly print, uh, put a put statement here with this syntax. The variable name is equal to and it will print out the values in the log. So you can quickly go to the log and see the values. So the values are here, right? So if you want to uh, see what is the exact log that got generated, I would recommend go to the log window, keep on clearing the log, and then run your codes. This will help you in exactly relating to what the output is getting generated, right? Okay, so there, uh, there is a title statement that I have given in this proc print step, okay? So title statement helps in printing that title. So title, what do you mean by title? Title is something that appears first on any report, on any page. It is exactly similar to that. The title will appear as the first thing on the page and then your output will come up, okay? So I'll show you a brief demo of round function now, okay? So uh, from, a, from a layman's perspective, an average user round means it will round up, but SAS provides round function as a versatile function. So you can control to what value, to which place of decimal, either at the right of the decimal or to the left of the decimal, you want to round, round up the value, right? So what I'll do is I'll run this piece of code. This piece of code is giving a number as 12345.67890 and you're rounding it up. So see, see the syntax of this function and see how it works. So num is what you are in uh, they provided the input so num will be this value right and you are rounding it up to two places of decimal to one place of decimal to no place of decimal to the first place of left of decimal to the ten your tens place of decimal to the hundred place of decimal to the left of the decimal so if you put a decimal here the rounding up will be done to the right of the decimal if you don't put any decimal and simply increase the number of zeros it will be rounded up to the left of the decimal okay I'll go ahead and submit this code code is complete and this is the output. So what is there in this report that was not expected? So Kiran has a question, what is the format num15.5 mean? So we'll cover formats and in formats later, but to answer your question quickly right now, it means a decimal number which has a total digit length of 15 out of which five digits are to the right of decimal and the rest are to the left of decimal, okay? It's a number format. So you can tell SAS what kind of number you're trying to feed in and SAS will accordingly adjust its floating point arithmetic. So for the time being, it means total 15 digits will be there, five digits to the left of the decimal and if decimal is counted, so six, so nine digits to the left of the decimal, okay? So guys, uh, have a close look at this output and tell me what is there in this output that was not expected. 
I'll show you the code once more. This is the code. Okay. Follow the code till proc print up till here. Now see what is there in the report which is not expected. You should be very careful about it. Okay. Come on guys, let's let's make it an interactive session so that you learn as the session progresses. You don't need to go back and review the notes and review the video and everything. Just just be follow this what I'm telling you and uh, kind of pay a little bit of attention. You will be able to understand what is happening. So these are the subtleties. What is there in this output that is not expected? That shouldn't have been there. Okay. So Kiran wants to see the code. So Kiran, here is the code from data up till proc print step. This is what I've executed. So it is very clear that we'll have a number imported and then we'll do some rounding up to generate new variables in the data set. Output dot round my data d1, d2, d3, d4, d5, d6. Okay. So there will be a variable called num which is encountered. So remember the PDV logic, program data vector. The, the variables will be created in the PDV as and when they are encountered. So the first variable that was encountered in this data step was data step was num, num. So a num variable was created in the PDV. Then which variable was encountered? This is num again. So num is already created. It will just assign the format. Then d1 is encountered. Then d2. Then d3, d4, d5, d6. Okay. So all this is fine. Num d1, d2, d3, d4, d5. What about this title? Why is it coming up again? So this is a SAS feature that unless you reset the title or you change the title, the title that was previously printed in your session will carry on being printed to the rest of the outputs. This is a SAS feature. So don't don't panic if you see, oh my god, the title is getting repeated. I don't know what is happening and why is it happening like that. So in this case, suppose we want to uh, reset the title. I mean, we want to put the title again blank because earlier when we were printing out, there was nothing coming up as a, as a title, as a header. So if you want to remove that, we'll run title and nothing inside single quotes. It is kind of null title. So there is no title now. Okay. And now if I pro print it again, see again, there is some lag here. So it, sh it keeps on showing the previous window. So that is what is happening. That is what happened earlier. So the latest print procedure was here, but it was showing the last, the third last printed procedure. So keep an eye on the right side as well. Uh, this will not be visible if you have maximized this interface. Okay. So keep an eye on the right side as well. Uh, the latest output appears at the end and it is bold. If you have checked it, it will cease to be bold. I mean, if you have printed it out, it will cease to be bold. Okay, so keep an eye on this. In order to change the title or reset the title, either you have to say title null or you can say this is my roundup title. All these things are going to help you in build a complete SAS code, a SAS code which is understandable by everyone, which looks good, which generates decent reports which does fantastic analytics all this builds into that all this is required for that this is my roundup title okay the title has been now changed to this sentence okay so let me show you the output again of the roundup function and then we'll understand step by step what is happening a roundup function is a kind of slightly tricky function. You need to be careful what you are rounding up to and what are the values coming up. Okay, so let's follow this. So remember D1 was rounding to the second place of decimal, D2 to first place of decimal, and then it was moving towards the left of the decimal. So let's talk about D1. So this is my original number. 
T1 to second place of decimal, so it will look at the second place, see the number against it. If it is greater than 5, it will round it up. 5 or greater than 5, it will round it up. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, right? To the first place of decimal, it will have a look at this. It is the number just beside the first decimal place is greater than 5. It will round it up to one higher number, so 6 will become 7. Then it will round it up, determining as to what is the immediate number after the decimal to determine if this number is plus one or a, or the same number. So it is six, so it will round it up to one, two, three, four, six, because five will get incremented to six, right? This is what rounding up means. You see the digit just beside that and this, uh, and depending upon whether it is greater than the half of what you're trying to round up uh, or less than half of what you're trying to round up, it will be uh, either incremented by one or it will remain the same. Okay, so see these two numbers are exactly the same. And what are these two? It is rounding up, saying round num or rounding up till first place of left of decimal. So you do any of these, it will remain the same. It has no difference at all. Okay, then we see the tens place. So we are coming to four now. Okay, so tens place. So what are the multiples of 10, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100? So in case of rounding up till 10's place, if the number if the number is closer to the next 10's multiple, it will be rounding up to that. Or if it is closer to the previous 10's multiple, it will be rounding up to that. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so 45. It will either be rounded up to 50 or it will be rounded up to 40. So it is 45. So 45 is closer to 50 right so it will come to be one two three five zero any doubts about this get this very clearly okay round round function is slightly tricky and if you're aiming for certification it will definitely be asked okay so having said that the last roundup was being done till three places of decimal to the left of the decimal so one two three four five so again when you're talking about three places of decimal it means multiple of 100, so 100, 200, 300, 400, so 345. So 345 is closer to 300 than to 400. So on a, on a high level, the bottom line is, wherever your number stands, if it is greater than half of what you are trying to round up, in this case, I'm trying to round up to 100, okay, follow this last case, if you are trying to round up till 100, so if it is greater than the half of 100, that means it is greater than, say, 150, 250, 50, 350, and so on and so forth. So it will be rounded up to the next 100th multiple. But if it is less than half of it, it will be rounded back to the 100th multiple. So in this case, it will be rounding up to the 1, 2, 3, double zero. Okay? Does it make sense? Okay? So... Suppose I give a number 12.6. So suppose I run this data step and I print out the value. What should be the output of this? Come on guys, give it a try. At least what you've learned up till now, give it a shot. Give it a shot given that, do you even have a hundred place in this number? Okay. So if you do not have a hundred place in this number and you try to run this, Give it a shot, what will be the output? Come on, answer it. Have a perception, have a concept in mind. Don't worry if uh, it, it gets wrong, okay? Uh, I need more answers. Come on, uh, Kuldeep, Subrata, Kiran. I have an answer from Hema. What about the other guys? Oh, the answer is zero. 
no no there will be some output right i mean it has to throw up something out of it because i provided a genuine number so it has to throw something out of it so uh hema i'll i'll tell you why the answer won't be what you have suggested because if you follow what i've said i said if you are more than or standing on the half of what you are rounding up to it will be rounded to the next uh, available round uh, whole whole number figure but if you are standing less than half of what you are rounding up to it will be rounded up to the previous figure so 100 is what we are rounding up to there is no 100 in 12.6 but it is less than 50 right the half of 100 was 50 so 50 or greater than 50 would have made it 100 okay but it is less than 50 so it will be rounded up to 0 see just by providing a 100 here the output has changed dramatically you should always have a close look at how it is working how the mechanics of these functions are working suppose i take it off and i do a simple round now can you tell me what should be the answer come on now it's very simple yes so people have answered it correctly hema kiran everybody so it should be 13 right because when i'm saying it i just want to round this up so the it will be a unit uh, that i'm looking at so 12.6 the closest whole number a unit more than it or less than it is 13 and not 12 okay it was 12.4 now it goes without saying okay so you you got my point suppose this was okay so i hope you've got the point right so is this making sense to everyone guys if you if you have even 1% doubt go ahead ask your query you should be clear what we are doing don't just see the code run it and see the output and say this is the output you should always be able to be question as to why this is the output i want you guys to become an inquisitive saas programmer and not just a simple programmer not just a simple developer who is being asked to do something you just follow the codes from here and there and just uh, put up together something and get it done question everything what you are doing uh, be mindful of what the output is coming up is it as per your expectation if not where is it going wrong how can you tweak the code and everything like that okay so quick uh, output on my data set what i have created so this is the output that i created and then i am setting it and i am printing out the values of stint so that's fine i mean you have already got the idea so you can create your own data set and you can see how the output is coming up so this brings me uh, to a topic which is uh, comparing the sum function and the addition operator okay i'll tell you what i'm trying to say so first i'll show you the code and then i'll show you how it works so we are working on my first data that that we know that we have seen uh, what i'll do is i'll do a proc contents of my data so that i can quickly show you what it looks like in case you don't have a copy in front of you because uh, every time you won't be able to uh, relate as to wh what the data look like and uh, why the output is coming as is i'll do a quick proc contents and save it in an excel so i hope now you have started uh, printing out the contents values and all and started copying it back to your local machines in excel right that is a handy way of uh, keeping things with you i mean you don't need to every time run proc contents just to see what variables were there so you can in this case you can go ahead copy this and if you paste it right here you'll have it okay as simple as this and now what i'm trying to do is i'm trying to sum the values stint 1 stint 2 stint 3 see 
the way I have written these statements. These are all valid SAS statements and they help you in uh, realizing the variety of in which you can uh, add things, uh, you can you can ag aggregate things. So I'm doing the same thing in all the three statements. The third one is a bit different because I'm adding a number 10 to each of the figures as well, but the first, these two statements are absolutely same. But let us see if the output generated is same. I'll go ahead and run this. Okay, so in case you have a series of variables, so this is handy for you, right? So uh, see this and use, try to use it in your uh, own codes. So if you have a series of variables, say stint 1, stint 2, stint 3, stint n. So SAS is smart enough to understand that if you want to sum it them all up, you don't need to write them one by one by one. You can simply say sum of, this is mandatory, and then series starting uh, term and series ending term. So it'll, it knows it has to sum it all up. Let us see the results. Okay, have a look at this. These were the these were the input values, and when we are adding it using a plus operator, using the addition operator, these two values have got added correctly. But this is what? Is this a value? Okay, Hema has a question. Stint one, stint A, stint B, stint three. No, uh, stint one, two, three won't work like that because it has to find those variables in series. Anyway, stint 1 dash 3 won't work, right? Because SAS will take it as uh, stint 1 minus the number 3. So you have to be careful with that, right? So guys, can you tell me if there is a number appearing here, what is this? This is, this is the number or is it a missing value? Yes, it is missing. But, yes. So everyone has got it correctly, this is missing, but why is it missing? There was some value in stint 1 and stint 2, only stint 3 was missing, so why is it missing? And how about this? Okay, so why is it adding, I mean, sorry, we are comparing these two columns, this is the third column, I'll talk it about later, so we are comparing these two columns, so it has two values, so the sum should come up, but it came up only in the sum function, not when I was adding it up using the plus op. So this is a feature of SAS, and I'll tell you later when we do uh, retain and aggregation that why the plus operator behaves like this, but it's a good practice if you use the sum function to add up values and not the plus operator. Yes, sum ignores missing values. Absolutely, Hema, sum will ignore missing values, and it's a, always a good practice if you, if you just have to add the values, give the sum function, and it will add on the values. So have that figure in front of you, visualize this, that whatever is happening, is happening horizontally, right? It took me some time to realize this, but uh, I, since I am here and you are already doing this course and you are, you are, you are focused, you have decided you are going to learn it, so take it in the first instance itself, that whatever operations you are doing happens horizontally, right? This is not happening vertically. The 2.1 doesn't get added to 25.6 and 1.25. When I'm saying stint 1 plus stint 2 plus stint 3, it means it for each observation, it will keep on adding these three values. You should be very clear about it. There should be no confusion at all. So if the values are non-missing, the sum function and the plus operator will return the same values. But if the values are missing, only the sum function will return a non-missing value. The add operator will return missing values. Okay, so whatever variable gets created, gets created. So in this case, some stints was getting created. Some stints, this is the variable. Similarly, add stints, similarly, some stints incremented by 10. All these variables are getting created. So they'll get created for all the observations, for all the observations in the data set and horizontally doing those observations. So if it was adding these three variables, it will add 2.1, 3.6, 4.45, .4 that's it. So this visualization should be absolutely clear. You should never get confused. You should always keep in mind the moment you are creating a new variable here, it will get created for all the observations in your data set. Always. This is how PDV reads it. Okay. So there is there are other uh, functions now uh, which are character type of functions. So l let us have a look at them as well. Okay. So this is a 
brief overview of numeric functions. As I said, this is a non-exhaustive list. Go ahead, check out all the functions that you have. So this, this screenshot is from SAS Studio. You have some class data set in your SAS help directory. Set it, create a new data set. Define a new variable called height feet, which is height by 12, height in feet, height rounded, round height feet, weight plus 5, some weight 5. So, yeah, so just one thing I wanted to show you. So the last variable that I was creating was summing these three variables and adding a value of 10 to it. See, in one statement I've done at least two, two calculations. I added these three together and added a value of 10 to it. So this is all possible. So the idea is you should be efficient in programming. You should be efficient in knowing uh, the best possible way to achieve an objective. So suppose if, you, if you're not aware of the facility of some function, you will have created a new variable which says new where is equal to now this sum stint plus 10, right? So this is something that you should be aware as a SAS programmer that this is, this is already a facility provided and we can use it, okay? So just a quick uh, brief about it. So this is how your uh, output will look like in your SAS studio. You should try it out there. This brings us to the character type of functions that are available. Okay. So again, this list is non-exhaustive and character type of functions are used in plenty. Lots and lots of transformations and operations are done on characters, right? If you, if you, uh, if you follow the production uh, systems or if you see the data that is coming up from upstream or going to downstream, the majority of the data has string values, majority of it. There are lots of string values that you need to either transform, that you need to either uh, manipulate, concatenate, trim, lots of operations to be done. This is what precisely ETL does. Okay, So SAS is a powerful ETL tool in itself. When I say tool, I mean an application. It's, so don't don't think that every SAS system has a GUI on it. So there are some SAS systems in which you have to hard code. Every time you have to write a code, okay? So there are lots of uh, transformational functions uh, available for string, for character type of values in SAS. Some of them are like substring, left, length, upcase, trim, compress, and argument one, concatenated with argument 2 and put function. So see, as I said, put is a frequently used keyword in SAS. Now there is a put function, okay? So I'll tell you what it is, but uh, we'll pick up the functions one by one, but just to give you a quick overview, substring will take an argument and will start from a value till some, so for these many values. This is not till, this is for these many values, okay? And if there is no n, it will, uh, pull out the substring till the end. So similarly, left will pick up, uh, I will align the string that is provided to it as a left line string. Length will return the value of the length of the string and if, if it is missing, if it is a blank, it will return one. Be mindful of that, it will not return zero, it will return one, okay? I'll show you. Up case, you're changing the case for, from any case to upper letters to capital letters. Trim will remove the trailing blanks, compress, so we'll, we'll see uh, it now what are these functions and how do we use them. Okay, so in the data set that we have just created, so we'll see first what is the length of the name variable, what is the length of the scale variable, okay. So if I run this, it should show me what is the length of these variables or rather I should run all these three together so that you are able to compare as to what was expected in the data set and what it is coming up. This is what is coming up. The name is 14 characters. So have a look at this. The length is varying. So as I said, if you are creating a new variable, it will be created for all the observations in the data set. That, that means if I'm trying to calculate the length of the name, it will calculate the length for all the names that are there in the data set. So for this, the length was 14. For this second observation, the length was 13. For this, the length was 9. And for this, the length was 14. Okay? Does it make sense? So it keeps on varying 
depending upon what your value was. So this is what your argument is. And this is what I mean by saying that if you create a new variable, it will be created for all the observations in the data set. All the observation. Yes, it will it will count it. So if you if you see one, two, three, because it is going from start till end. So if there is something in between, it will count it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. So this is fourteen, including the space. It will count it. Yes. It will not count any leading or trailing blanks. And by that, I mean originally the name was of 20 characters. The name variable was of 20 characters, defined as 20 characters. But it was holding only 14 characters. And I'm interested in knowing how many bytes it is holding. So the length function, by definition, will return you only the character, the number of characters from the start of the string till the end of the string. If it is missing, it will return a value 1, C. For the length scale, the last is value 1 because there is no scale here. So for blank, it will return 1. Okay. Kiran, does it answer your question? Okay. So we will now see how we can trim the values and how can we print out uh, the contents of the data set. So Every time you do some operation on modifying the attributes of variables, that means the length of the variable, the type of the variable, and label of the variable, you should always rely on proc contents to see if it has taken place and you were right in doing the modification that you were trying to do, right? So, for example, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to trim the name and store it in a variable called trim name, trim the skill, and store it in a variable called trim skill, okay? So, and then I will print out First, I'll do this, and then I'll show you some variations of proc contents so that you can pick up the one which suits you the best. Because simple proc contents data is equal to data set name and then run gives a lot of information. I'm sure you might have already seen it by now. It will throw up. See, this is my roundup title still appearing up unless I do a title. Reset statement. So you should always be careful. Whatever is appearing in your output or log, you should always be careful. So this this is kind of an indication for me that I should reset the title. So I'll reset the title, and then I'll show you the variations of how you can use proc contents. Okay. So proc contents, this data set name and position, and then proc contents data set name output to another data set. Don't print it. Don't don't show the details. Okay. Let's not use this. Let's use this because I want to show you how you want how you can only pick up. Yes. So let us print these contents. Okay. It takes some time to refresh. See the title is gone, okay? And if I just said proc contents, data set name, position, it will arrange the variables depending upon when and how they were encountered. Can you see it? So this all is subtlety in this uh, procedure and there is a, there are a lot of subtleties like this in SAS. You always to be, you always be careful as to why this output is coming at in this way and you should understand that since there is a position option this is called an option this option is specified in the proc contents hence the variable as and when it was encountered by the pdv and created in the output data set will be printed out in that order so it says name was encountered first then skill and stand and so on and yes this was the order and suppose i just want only the variable names to appear see see the condensed output that I've generated from these two statements. Okay, so why I'm showing you this is suppose you just want this information. So if you if you just want this information, you can put this in a small macro somewhere. I'll, I'll, this session won't cover macros, but the macro is a kind of reusable function that you can create in SAS and then you can call it just to print out the list of variables. So this will just print out what variables are there, nothing else, no details about it. Okay, so there are lots of variations what how you can 
get the variables, how can you get the list of variables about your data set, how you can print them out. So you should keep on tinkering with the options. So my message to you is uh, exhaustively follow what are the options available for any proc in SAS. It is uh, kind of humanly not possible to explore all the options in a three hour long class. Okay, so it, it becomes imperative that you go ahead, check the knowledge base and then kind of use all the options and then see how it, the output comes up. Okay, so trim is removing the trailing blanks. So Kiran, uh, trim is removing the trailing blanks. Kiran wants to know what does the trim function do. Uh, if you provide a string which has some trailing blanks, trim will strip off the trailing blanks. Okay, it you'll understand, appreciate the value of stripping off leading and trailing blanks once we do some more uh, walk through through the character type of functions because uh, spaces in characters can be a big headache, in pro especially in production systems when you are expecting a five character field and, uh, and it comes as right aligned and not left aligned so there are spaces leading so the, the, the value to be matched doesn't match and the job fails. So you have to be very careful as to how the space is coming up. So I was showing you the variations of proc contents. There is one more variation which says proc contents data is equal to trim demo short. Okay, so if I run this, so see variables in alphabetic order for work dot trim demo. So it will just print out a, nine, uh, a line with variable names separated by spaces. Can you see it? So if you want just a quick view of what the variables are in your data set, you can do a proc content and short option. It will just show you the variables in one straight line separated by spaces and I think if it would suit a very uh, quick purpose of seeing what all the variables are there. Okay. Uh, so I'll also quickly touch upon how do you see or display all the contents of a library in SAS. Something like you do a ls in Unix or a dir in Windows. Okay, so how do you do that in SAS? So there is a proc called proc datasets. It accepts the library as lib is equal to library name and then contains data for all the members of that library and no descriptor portion. So no ds, no descriptor portion. So if I run this, so there is some lag in my output coming up. Don't worry about that. I'll keep on uh, picking up the latest output. So this is how the output looks like. The data set procedure, it's a proc available and where it is pointing to, the library that I had referred to, SAS help. SAS help is a library reference that is understood and uh, worked upon by the SAS system itself. So SAS help is currently the physical location for SAS help library is home Ubuntu WPS 3.1.2 slash SAS help. The access is read only because it is provided by SAS. They, if you want to do something on your own, you can create your own library reference and you can work on it. So these are the members of this library. Okay. And if you have a data set, it will be called data. So I have a zip code. I have a authorization library and so on. The rest are views and catalogs. So we won't touch upon them uh, or maybe I'll tell you they are or but for the timing if you're looking at some data sets this is what should interest you something that has data in the member type okay so just a quick tip for you if you want to see what that data sets are there in your SAS help library you can go ahead uh, run this proc and have a look at it okay so we'll now see the cat family of functions so cat means concatenation simple so it stands for concatenation okay so I'll show you this piece of code and then we'll see uh, follow it line by line and then we'll see how the output is coming up so concatenation is frequently used in string manipulations so suppose we have four variables a which is ABC B which has some space and then consulting C which has ink and then some space D which has some space and then team and then some space okay so we'll use cat s cat t and cat s functions to concatenate the strings okay each of these now what i was telling earlier this is how sas has evolved so there was one cat function say cat s and then as and when the need was in the upgraded version they provided cat x and cat t 
as well. So uh, if there is a demand, there is a requirement, it, the functions come up in the upgraded versions of SAS. So now it has a lot of other uh, concatenation functions as well, but we'll focus on these. And uh, as I discussed, we'll put a put statement here to make sure that the output gets returned to the log file as well. OK. Uh, I'll do one variation after we run this code and then you'll be able to understand and appreciate why are we printing the value in log as well. So let me run this. Uh, theoretically, what this function is going to do is it is going to concatenate these two variables and strip off the leading and trailing blanks, the leading and trailing both. So and while we are at it, I want to use, I wanted to show you this that any matching parenthesis will be shown by the editor itself. So if you don't have a matching parenthesis, it, it won't be shown. So suppose I, I wrote, I gave one more parenthesis, there is no matching parenthesis to it. So while we are coding, while we are programming, you should be mindful of it that your code is not syntactically wrong. So it will concatenate these two values, strip off the leading training blank, similarly these three values, strip off the leading training blank, similarly concatenate this and this and strip off the leading training blank. So there is a hard coded value I'm giving in, so it will do that. Cat T will concatenate and remove only trailing blanks. So as you say, as you can see, there's a T here. So it will only remove the trailing blanks. It won't worry about the leading blanks. Now the question that should come to your mind is how, why do I need so many variations of concatenation? And the answer is, trust me, in real life, the, the scenario would be something that you might even need to create your own function of concatenation. So there are so many scenarios in real life that given the fact that your system is accepting data from multiple sources and it has to push data to multiple uh, target destinations that many a times you require certain kind of uh, functionality in your code. So if there is a function pre-provided, well and good. If not, you have to do it yourself. So the, the reason we have so many variations of concatenation is because in real life you do require all sorts of variations of concatenation. Okay, I'll, I'll show you. Uh, what are the variations here? So it will remove the trailing blanks and concatenate it. This one will concatenate and remove cat x. That will concatenate and remove all the leading and trailing blanks and place also place a character of our choice between the, the concatenated string. What do I mean by that? So if I say cat x is equal to space and then a and b, it will concatenate these two. Okay strip off all the uh, leading and trailing blanks and introduce a space in between these two variables, in between these two values. So suppose you got the first name from somewhere, last name from somewhere, and there were some leading trailing spaces and you want to generate a full name of a person. This is how you will do it. You will strip off the leading and trailing blanks, concatenate them, and then introduce a space between first name and last name. So this is a real life example I just gave for you to understand why do we, why do we need so many concatenation functions okay so in this case i'm not interested in uh, pro in providing any character to be introduced between these two variables so i've given a null here a blank here i mean nothing it's null so they'll be completely adjacent to each other there will be no space between these two values between a and b in this case there will be a colon and in this case there will be an underscore between hello and d so let us go ahead and run this code. I'm walking you through this code line by line because I want you to understand and be inquisitive and curious about what is going on because you can get lots of code over the internet and you you can do at least 60 to 65% of what you want to do right from copying the code from here and there. But uh, when the uh, requirement gets complex when the requirement is one of its kind or uh, a generic kind of thing you require your own programming skills to solve it right you cannot depend on somebody else else code you cannot depend on whether somebody will come back and help you out so have a look at this this was variable a variable b variable c variable d so don't worry if you don't see the spaces here because it has kind of uh, shrunk this output so it is showing up like this but see how the values are stacking up. So cat s strip off the leading and trailing. So there was no space in ABC and uh, consulting, so it has uh, completely joined it. There was uh, the, the three variables that will be joined is ABC consulting. So uh, don't worry if you see if you see all this concatenated together because uh, 
I mean, you don't see the spaces because this is the view it is showing us to showing to us. You can do a proc content on this data set and you can see what are the values coming up. So, uh, I hope you understand that on a variable level, if you want to see how what is the length of that variable, you will do a length of that variable to see what is the actual length of that variable, right? The the way we discussed earlier. So, if it is a defined as a 20 character variable, it might not be a 20 character it might have some spaces and the real characters would be around 13 14 or whatever it is so you should do a proc content to kind of convince yourself that yes this is it so right now this is all uh, fine because the leading and trailing spaces are stripped off so it will concatenate as is so on and so forth the trailing will be concatenated the leading will not be so consulting had a space prior to it so abc space consulting it has come on to the second line okay so at least it is showing you that okay i am uh, including a space here. Now we're concatenating these three, so ink had no space, it is concatenated like that, so on with hello team, and see how catex is behaving now. So catex, the first thing was, I was trying to introduce a space, so these two look similar, but this is introducing just one space, and this is carrying all the space from consulting, consulting a lot of space prior to it, but when you look at it out in the output, it is looking at just the same, but it's not the same. There is just one single space here, and there are multiple spaces here. What about catex when you are uh, consult when you are concatenating two values? So, no separation. There is whatever was the space. So, I'm saying there was no separation. That means the space as is will be kept. Okay. Now, there is some. Uh, we are providing colon to concatenate. So, the colons will be introduced between two concatenating values. So there are three values getting concatenated in ABC concatex, this one. So the, between A and B, there will be a colon. Between B and C, there will be a colon, right? And in the last catex operation, I was trying to introduce a minus sign between hello and D, and this is how it has done it. So this is handy. Catex function is a handy function. It helps you in uh, concatenating values. Uh, stripping off the blanks, getting rid of unwanted uh, blanks, and uh, introducing your own separators. So it's it's always good to know about cat x cat cat category of functions. So we call them cat family of functions. Okay. So since we had printed out these two values in the log as well, so cat x a b result and cat x a b result will also be printed out, and this is how it looks like. So here you can at least see the spacing. So the AB will be just having one space here, and the cat S has stripped off all the spaces. See how clearly it has come up. So if you want to quickly check what exactly the output is looking like, you can do a put of that variable so that the variable will be printed out in the log. So a quick word about log. Uh, log has its own uh, lines, line numbers that get generated. So there will be times when you will need to follow this line number where the error comes up. So uh, don't worry if, if the log says line number 1000 something and your code has only 300 lines because it is not talking about the line number of, our, of your code. It is talking about the line number in your log. So have a, a close eye on that, uh, the line number that is all appearing. Most of the times it is the line number of your log and the column of your log. So uh, log is very uh, handy in knowing how the output looks like. If there is an issue, you can go back and fix it. Okay. So any questions uh, on this? or uh, we can move forward guys so don't hesitate to direct your queries uh, I strongly encourage you to ask as many questions as possible make this session the most learning session for SAS don't uh, think about you'll get back to it and you will see the video again you'll see the presentation again. I mean that is secondary the primary thing is make this session the most fruitful session for SAS learn as much as possible okay so We'll come to uh, the other function, which is called compress function. So as the name says, it compresses a string. So compresses means it removes unwanted characters from the string, right? So see the syntax here. There is a input statement here. Now this is a, a kind of new input for you. What it is doing is it is reading from, now this is an in format. So this is a format in format that we are defining that from column 1 to column 15 the value has to be read and it will be read as a string can you tell me why we are reading it as a string it is a common sense question and I want you guys to quickly answer this 
yes absolutely am i right so guys come on quickly answer it why are we reading it as a string because it is a phone number right it should be read as a number because yes no 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 so kiran so kiran uh, the dollar is the in format dollar is my instruction to the sas system that this is a character type of value to be read from column number 1 to column number 15 which columns column in this editor column 1 and so on till column 15 right it is my instruction to sas it is not there in the data the data is this okay so so i have mentioned it as a i specified the informant as a character informant because it has curly it has parenthesis it has hyphen in the data itself the moment you try to import it into a numeric field it will throw an error and you are trying to apply a character function on top of it right that's your objective always be clear of what you are trying to do you are trying to apply a character function you cannot do it on a numeric variable you have to first declare that my variable is character type and then i'll import that variable import that value into the variable and then i'll, I'll apply the character function on top of it so that is why it, we have instructed the sas system to read it as a character and then we'll apply the compress function on top of it so the first statement will remove the blanks and the second statement it removes so compress function will remove whatever unwanted characters are there in your string i mean you specify them and the uh, function will be ha more than happy to do that for you so i'll show you the output so that you can understand what it is taking off from your string okay so i said the first was a simple compress function so compress and the argument to it right so what it is doing is it is just removing the blanks from your data so there were so the first one had no blanks but the second data had first blank here and the second blank here so it took off all the blanks default default behavior of compress function but the second compress function was provided with specific inputs as to what needs to be taken off from the data taken off means deleted from the data it won't be there right it if it finds that value replace it by a null it will delete it from there so i i had given it a parenthesis a hyphen and a space everything so the special characters or the non numeric character that were appearing were only these characters so they will be taken off deleted and the value will be a plain number in front of you okay any questions on this it's a handy function uh, works great if you if there are few values uh, that need to be quickly taken off uh, however if it's a kind of regular expression match there are regular expression searches and uh, replacement and substitutions in sas so uh, it's not that efficient when you're doing a regular expression so right now for your purpose this is great so the next function that we would like to talk about is the transvert function okay so transvert function will replace a character that you provide with some other character that you provide okay in the target string so what i am trying to say here is suppose you have a target string called phone so again i have read from 1 to 15 columns a string type of value a character type of value which is again this the numbers the same the same data okay so in the first transvert function i am specifying that i want to replace the hyphen with a slash this much but you can use transvert on top of transvert so kind of nested transvert so whatever output will come out from this if it has a left parenthesis it will be replaced by a colon are you getting it is this statement clear to everyone great so guys answer with a yes or no because uh, oh it's not clear so kiran what i'm trying to say is the innermost part of a function will be evaluated first and it is the common logic for all programming languages whenever you are trying to do some nested operation the innermost part of the operation is executed first so transvert function the arguments to the transvert function are the target string the character to be found to be searched and the character to be replaced with 
right? Because the transport function is used to replace a character with some other character. You're trying to do a substitution, translate word. So the tran word has come from something called translate word. So you're translating from something to the other thing. So the innermost trans tran word function is this one. It will work on the phone variable, replace hyphen with slash, and the output, if it has a left parenthesis, it will be replaced by a colon as well. Okay. What will the phone all two variable hold? It will do the same thing, but if there is a twice, if I have provided that twice, uh, the twice, uh, the both the parentheses, it will replace them by colon. Let us see the output and follow it very closely. Everybody has seen the code, so I'll run this code and now let us see what the output comes up. As I said, follow the output because only then you will understand whether the output matches your expectation. Okay, so this is the output. So this is the for for these two, for the phone all one, what is happening is. After it has replaced hyphen by a slash, it will replace the left parenthesis with a colon, and that is fine. That what that is what it has done. The left parenthesis has been replaced by a colon. The hyphen has been replaced by a slash. That's it, right? It works. What about the phone all two? The hyphen was replaced by a slash, and we were expecting that both the parentheses will be replaced by a colon. But this is not how transport works. It will accept a character and replace it with a character. You cannot provide a series of characters. You cannot provide a series of characters to it and expect it to replace them. So, if you provide just this, it will work. And the reason is there are other functions to take care of that. Okay, there are other functions to find us find an expression and replace it with something else. So, as I said, the, there is a long list of uh, functions, and you need to be aware of how it works so let me go ahead and run this any any questions in this is the transport function clear come on guys yeah one character when I say character alpha you can say alphabet or a character also works no 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 not one word so Hema is asking whether it can replace one word with another so you have different functions for it and you should use those functions and not tran word okay Okay, so uh, this brings us to a very important family of functions called substring. The substring is a very commonly used function. Okay, in almost all programming languages and environments, we use substring. So substring, as the name suggests, it extracts or pulls a piece of the string from the target string. Okay, whatever the target string is, you specify that piece and it will pull up that piece for you so it can be the entire string itself or no part of the string or some part of the string any permutation combination so I'll run this code and you'll be able to understand what it is doing so again a column uh, defined data lines is there so one to nine there is some character here and then there are some digits at the end of the value so state if I'm trying to see my input will be this entire value now I'm using the substring function to derive meaning or to derive meaningful data out of it. Now this is how I say that SAS helps you in deriving insights from the data. This is the first level of doing that. So data massaging, data scrubbing, data cleansing, all this is a part of uh, what we are trying to do. So all these functions will help you in uh, doing these act activities on top of your data. So they, these are your kind of tools, your, uh, your ammunition in the battlefield of data you know because data can come in any form I mean it can be garbled or uh, you have to pull out the uh, structure from the data so you have to be ready with all these functions so that you can apply them and uh, bring out the data that is meaningful to you so we are trying to find out the state from here the way we'll do is I'll say start from the first character of the string and pull out two two characters okay and if I try, if I'm trying to find out what is the number, say it, it is any number. What is the number that is associated with that state? So I'll say pull out the seventh thing. See this. So don't worry about input function. I'll tell you what it does. So read this 
ID variable, go to the seventh character. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seventh is one, and then pull out three characters from it. Okay. So this is a string or a character that is returned from this substring and print it out as a number. So input function, as I told you, put function helps in printing any value, any uh, uh, variables value into a character format. Similarly, input function helps you printing that value into a numeric format. Okay, we'll take it up later in detail. Don't worry about it. But for the timing, just understand that whatever value has been returned will be returned as a will be stored as a number in the num field in the num variable. Okay, so if I run this, this is how it is coming up. So this was the variable after substringing it. The first two characters were my state, and the last three were my number. Okay. By using this input statement, we have made sure that we are storing it as a number in SAS. Otherwise, since we are substringing it and it is a string that we are importing, it will be stored as a string, right? Is this clear? This is a simple usage of sub substring, sub str function in SAS. Okay. There is an another usage of sub str function in SAS. Okay, which which is kind of uh, tricky and which is also used in SAS. So this was something that the sub str function was on the right side of the equal to sign. There is also a usage of sub str when we put it on the left hand side of the equal to sign. Okay, when I say equal to sign, this is my equal to sign, and this is the right side usage of st sub str. I'll now show you that there is also a left side usage of st sub str function. Okay, what it will do is it will place the characters in specific locations within a string. On the left hand side of the equal to sign. Okay, so follow this data step. So there is a data called BP blood pressure. You are inputting systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, the length of systolic and diastolic will be 4. This is a character. Then you will want to assign this value into systolic and diastolic. Okay, and if the systolic is greater than, now come to this. If the systolic blood pressure is greater than 160, so if I see the data line, the first variable that I'm importing is 120 and the second is 80. So systolic is 120, diastolic is 80. So if it is greater than 160, then in the systolic blood pressure check, so this, this is a variable that we have defined, the fourth character will be marked with an asterisk. Okay, so we stored we brought these number these values as a number okay and we now store it as a character and we try to evaluate if it is greater than 160 we'll store the fourth value as a we'll mark the fourth value as a asterisk so if i if i run this code let me run this code and show it to you so the values that were brought in were 120, 80, 180, 92, 200, 110, 110. So when when we are evaluating these variables called systolic blood pressure check, if it is greater than 160, right? This was the condition that we provided. So we mark the fourth character as a star, and this is how it will look like. See, this is a very handy usage. You don't need to. Uh, create a new variable, uh, do some if else calculation, a simple one liner that if it is greater than 160, simply mark the fourth character as a star. So this was possible because we were using the left side sub str function. It will replace the fourth character as a star. Okay, this is a, this is a handy usage of left side usage of sub str. Uh, there are certain scenarios in which this comes in handy. So this is good to know. Okay, so there are many other string functions. Uh, we'll touch upon a few of them now, and uh, so that you get a uh, an idea as to how to apply the string functions on character type of variables and what output, how do they return the output, and how to use it further in your analysis. So. Searching the string is one of the most common uh, requirements. So how do you do that? You have plenty of options. 
So there is the common ones I'm going to discuss like index function, scan function, and find function. So let's start with the index with the scan function. The scan function is used to extract the nth string. Okay. So nth string means nth word. So word means if you don't specify the delimiter or the separator, so it will take it as a blank. Otherwise, if any of these characters come up, dot, less than, left parenthesis, plus, ampersand, so it will take it as a separator and it will keep on counting the words from then and there. Does this make sense, guys? So when I say used to extract the nth word, immediately it should come to your mind that how is it calculating word? How is it parsing a collection or a list of words as one word at a time? So the default approach is as the English language goes, two words are separated by a space, right? But if you want something else to act as a delimiter or as a separator between two words, you can provide it to the scan function. So follow this data step closely. There is a string called Mr. Dot Rob slash K star Thomas. Okay. Now title we are trying to extract as the first word of this string. So for SAS, this this is also separator, space is also separator, slash is also separator, asterisk is also separator. So it can easily say that this is the first word, this is the second word, this is the third word, this is the last word. Okay, the first word will be your title, which will be Mr. in this case. Second word will be the first name. Now surname, in order to calculate the surname, I'm saying scan str minus one. Now in some programming languages, it is possible that you start from the end of the list and uh, something like in Python, but it is also true in SAS. If you say minus one, SAS will immediately understand you want to start from the rightmost side of the sentence or the phrase, from the last of the sentence, from the last of the sentence, not the beginning of the sentence or the beginning of the phrase. You want to start from the last of the sentence and the first one. Okay, so the last word will be taken up. Now, I'm in the next statement I'm saying scan str hundred. So hundredth word. Okay. So hundredth word. Should it return an output for this? Yes, Kiran, you are right. It will return Thomas with a T capital. <laughs> so guys, I have a question for you. What do you expect the output of this statement to be? When we say some variable is equal to scan str hundred, in this string, what is the hundredth word? Come on, guys, give it a thought. It's a common sense question. What is the hundredth word in this string, in this phrase? Given that any of these can be a delimiter, so you've already seen some delimiters here, or a separator. What is the hundredth word in this string? Come on, guys. If you if you apply common sense to this, it will it will come up. The answer will automatically come to you. So Hema, when you say blank, what do you mean by it? I mean, do you see a hundredth word in this? Kuldeep, Subhubrat, Peter. So do you guys see a hundredth word in it? Yes. There is no hundredth word. So it will return nothing out of it. Let me run this and show you. There is no hundredth word, so it is an invalid argument to the scan function. Okay. So best way, go ahead see the log. So the log says it has evaluated everything. So the interesting thing is, and you should always observe it that it hasn't thrown an error. Because in many of the functions, the exception handling is already done, right? Why didn't it throw an error? Because the exception handling has already been done in this function. It is uh, able to handle the exception that the range or the word number was beyond the range of what is provided. So what will be the missing output for a character type of variable? It will be blank, right? So missing for a character type of variable is blank and the blank is the output for this, okay? Does it make sense? 
Okay, so let us quickly go through the index function and find function as well. These are similar functions, kind of doing the similar job but slightly different. So index function will search a character expression for a string of characters. So what I think Kiran was asking earlier, so how do you do that? Uh, how do you search a string of characters? So index helps you do that and returns the position of the string's first character for the first occurrence of the string. So what do you mean by this? Suppose you have a target string which is abc.def in bracket x is equal to y and the parenthesis closed and you want to search if there is a combination or a string of character called x is equal to y in the target string. So we know that there is a string a combination of characters called x is equal to y but how do you do it? You say index the target string and the pattern that you are looking at. Index parenthesis the target string comma the pattern you are looking at okay and then I want to show you how the spaces can wreak havoc on your expression so and then I trim the space because I've given some space here and then I try to find out okay so I'll run this and I have provided uh, the output in the log itself so let us run this Q is 0 and W is 10. So can you tell me why Q is 0 and W is 10? Because if your target string contains spaces, okay, or your sort or the pattern that you're trying to find contains spaces, so the match won't happen. So you have to be very careful as to what you're trying to match in the target string with the pattern. So what I'm trying to say is if you're trying to match x is equal to y in this so if there is a space it won't match up properly. I mean it won't match at all. Okay, if there is a space here. So you have to be careful if there are any leading trend because the reason I'm saying this is because what the, the if you run your code and you, you say there was a pattern like this and why isn't it picking up so the reason should would be because there were some blanks and it was not able to match up properly so this was a 14 character variable defined and this was not completely 14 so there were some blanks unless you trim them it won't be able to find it okay so be very careful uh, tinker it with it as much as possible uh, have some very weird kind of uh, strings in your uh, target as a target string and then try to find uh, patterns on it try to find do a scan on it try to do a find on it so this will help you in uh, realizing uh, the nuances of handling blanks spaces leading and trailing spaces in your uh, strings and how to get around with them how to how to fix those uh, blanks and get the result that you are expecting right so in this case the the defined length was 14 so the variable was not of 14 length so when you are trying to match it was matching up with the blanks and it didn't return a value so you need to trim it and then match it with the values okay so similarly we can go ahead and see the find function here so this is a very simple data step it says find gold uh, there is a variable called rocks uh, it has it is of 12 characters long and the data line says coal gold lead okay so first I'll run this without giving this option so what I'm trying to do is the the syntax for find function is find in rocks the target string the value called GOLD okay and it, I don't get this I option so let us run this and find gold would be printed out in the log so find gold says zero when when find returns a zero value it means it didn't find that value but I can see there is a gold here GOLD so can you tell me why wasn't it able to find it why wasn't it able to find GOLD in the yes Kiran you are right so yes Hema absolutely so 
the, the G is capital in the target string and in order to ignore the case there is an option called I I'll remove the parent the comment out and then I'll run it again so string matching again is case sensitive although SAS in itself is a case insensitive language you can write your codes in capital small you can start the statements on any line the moment till the time you are putting in the semicolons properly terminating the steps properly you can do any kind of weird programming in SAS but strings are case sensitive they have always been and they will always be because small and caps make difference in real life systems so for this reason you have to be careful whether you are matching it properly or not so now you see the fine gold has a value of 5 okay this is the slide that will uh, show you how to exp what to work on the SAS studio and how to expect the output to come up so the character functions are applied on it this pipe is concatenation it will uh, concatenate, concatenate name and age and introduce an underscore in between so as you can see there is a variable called name age it will have the name and the age separated by an underscore so if there are any spaces already there in the variables they will be carried over as is as you can see the variables do have some spaces so the name length will be the actual number of characters appearing in the name so for Alfred it will be six characters it is six and so on the first two will be the substring of the name variable starting from the first character until two characters so if it's Alfred so A L A for Alice it will be A L for Barbara it will be B A so I hope it is now becoming clear how these functions are used and what output do the do they generate so capital for a capital fun, uh, capitalize the values you use the upcase function similarly you have the lowcase function you can use them okay so this brings us to the SAS dates this uh, needs a little bit more attention because as I told you they are stored as a number in SAS so you have to understand how a number is stored in SAS which corresponds to a date okay so the idea is they have kept it simple and they have assumed the SAS system has assumed a reference point so any date will be calculated basis that reference point any date any calendar date is a interval from that reference point so when I say reference point what is the reference point for SAS it is the date January 1st 1960 so when you when you store a date which is January 1st 1960 in SAS the corresponding number that will be stored in SAS system will be zero okay does it make sense because when I say all the other dates will be calculated as a interval from that reference point I mean to say when you move ahead move forward from January 1st 1960 that means towards 1961 63 2000 2010 2015 16 so they all will be positive numbers and what those numbers will be number of days that have elapsed since January 1st 1960 okay because January 1st 1960 is a zero number date that is the zero and if you move to the left of that date prior to that date you will get a number which is negative so it is like a real number line the origin is January 1st 1960 if you move forward if you move towards uh, higher dates you get a positive number if you move towards lower dates to the left of it you'll get a negative number okay uh, is this making sense because this is critical to understanding how the values of date will be printed out when you print them out in your SAS codes okay unless you, you provide a format to it you won't see a date appearing in front of you you'll see some number some random number generated right so with this we'll understand how to instruct the SAS system to read the date that we are providing it with okay so as I told you in my previous class as well and I'll show you more examples on it today uh, you have to tell the SAS system that you are giving a MMDDYY or a DDMMYY or some other format of date because only then it will understand that it's a date and it has to convert it into some number okay so we'll we'll see what are the in formats available how do we manipulate those dates now dates are 
some uh, some number which can be manipulated right so what are the functions which can be applied directly on dates you don't need to tell the SAS system that this is a date and this is the function to be applied because although it is storing it as a number if you want to do some date arithmetic on it you won't do it as a number right you will you will have some logic of time interval some month day year week some kind of logic to be applied on that date okay and how do you print those dates so we'll talk about that so the important thing is uh, put function will come in handy for us so it's imperative that we understand how we should use put function to print the date into a human readable format as I told you the way SAS is storing date if it prints it out you cannot understand what it is trying to say it will show you some number so some number that means number of days elapsed since January 1st 1960 that will be the precise number when I say some number it will be the precise number that will show you but you cannot calculate it on your fingers you need some human readable form of date so this is the way you can print out the date from the SAS system to a human readable format print out to where maybe in your log maybe in the data set or wherever but if you want to read that thing you need to apply a put function so that you can read it so the first statement says you print out the value which is stored in SAS date variable as yymmdd10 dot when, when we say yymmdd10 dot it means count these characters 2002-12-26 so 4 to 6 to 8 to 10 so the total characters in this date will be 10 the year will come first then the month and the day see how easy, easy it is read this date so the format that we are trying to tell the SAS is print the number for uh, print the year first then the month and then the day okay what if I want to print the number in the month first so mmddyy10 dot so 12 slash 26 slash 2002 so if you change the format you will get a different format of date but it is human readable if you know what it is pertaining to these numbers are pertaining to you will understand uh, what the date is being referred to so yymm6 so all over six characters will be displayed this is a very typical SAS format uh, you should avoid using it because you don't get a complete picture of the date okay so again count the number of characters here four to six and that's what we are referring to six characters then we have a yymmdd n8 dot there is no separator in this it is a continuous date and it is eight characters in length then we have mmdd yy8 dot in this we have the year truncated to two characters okay no, uh, the the separator is taken off the year is complete but the separator is taken off again the month will be the first value that will appear okay so these are the variations of uh, dates that can be printed that can be read in SAS that can be printed out into a human readable format right there are thousands of date format uh, so Kiran has a question how do you get a minus or a slash so I'll, I'll tell you uh, Kiran shortly don't worry about that uh, it is all uh, doable I'll tell you how to do that L let us come to that point and we'll take it up okay so there are um, plenty of functions available to be worked upon dates the simple function like MDY so if you supply it the month day and year it will give you the date corresponding value to it then there is a very handy function called today okay so today means the current date the current date will be printed in today but again it will be a number if you want to print it out if you want to use it as a human readable format so you'll have to format it as a, a some date that can be interpreted by human being the date part function date part function will extract the date from a date time format so nowadays frequently it has been seen that a date field is actually a date time field because of several reasons I mean they want to attach a timestamp to it they want to make sure that which exactly which time it was captured so if you want to extract the date out of it you will say the date part function and then provide the argument to it and it will give you the date part okay then we have a month function which when applied to a date will give you the month corresponding to that date similarly you have a day function year function quarter function and lot of other functions but the functions we will be discussing in a bit detail today will be the int nx and the int ck function so these are uh, these require a little attention in the starting but once you get a hang of it you will be able to use them and manipulate dates in no time so 
uh, on a theoretical level, I'll tell you what these functions stand for and then I'll show you, uh, I'll run a piece of code in which you'll understand how do they actually work. Okay, so INTNX will increment the date by intervals. Okay, so argument is an interval, what is the unit of increment, like you want to increment the date by a day, month or year and the from is the date, date from which you want to start, n is the number of increments to be added and alignment is to control whether you want to start with the beginning of that period, the middle or the end of that period. Okay, INTCK counts the number of interval boundaries between two dates. So given two dates, which is from and to, it will count how many intervals have passed. Intervals of what? Of time. And what can be the time? It can be a day, month or year. Okay, so this is how uh, these date functions work and now let us see how we can work and we can import the dates. So first of all, a very simple uh, date printing logic here. So we'll, what we are doing is we are just assigning today's date to a variable called date1 and then we are printing out various formats of that date. So I'll go ahead, I'll print out these values. You need to practice more and more with these uh, functions at your own personal machines at your own time because the more you practice the more issues you'll face and then you'll understand why the result was not as per your expectations. You'll understand what, what difference did the option make, okay? So see the date was today's date. So the first date one was a number. See that is what I'm telling you. So it is a number. This is not a date. I mean not a human readable date. This is a number, okay? So SAS stores the current date as this number but when you apply formats to it, when you apply a YYMMDD, date 9 and so on and so forth, it will sh keep on showing you these formats, okay? So Kira, to answer your question, the default uh, separators are these, but we can tweak them. I'll show you how to tweak them. Let us see some manipulation with the dates and then I'll show you how to do it, okay? so. This is without any separator, this is just with the month, this is without any separator again starting with the year and month and day and this is a two character year, okay, 2nd, 28th February and 2016, only 16 is represented out of it. So this is the MMDTYYA dot format. So thousands of variations are available and uh, you need to be sure. So why do you need, why do you want, why do you should be aware of all these formats? Because if you don't know all these formats, you won't be able to instruct the SAS system that, look, I'm trying to import this value into this date time variable by this particular format. If you cannot specify that format, SAS is interpreted automatically and it will be some garbage value. So it is important that you are aware of the format and apply the correct format on the appropriate data. Okay, so similar to date, the date time value is is also stored in SAS again as a number, but it is stored as the number of seconds elapsed since January 1st, 1960. So this is a difference. So suppose, uh, I'll run this data step, but before that I'll tell you what I've written. For, for a quick reference and for running some test codes and just supplying some dummy dates, this is how you can do it. For example, if you want to run uh, the code for some date, so you just say, this is the date 9 format. You just say 2nd Jan 1960 and close it within semi with uh, quotation marks and then place a D. This D stands to instruct SAS that this is a date constant. Okay, this is a date that the user has provided. Why this D is in place, you will come to know when, when I create a new variable called date as string which also has this value but doesn't has a D, okay? So I'll go ahead, I'll run this. And I'll print it out. Okay. So there are three variables created in this data set. 
one is the date time again to create a value for a date time you have to put dt to instruct the sas system that this is a date time value that i am assigning to this variable and uh, so this is created and now we print out the values so date time you asked for is the number of seconds elapsed since January 1st, 1960, which is a huge number, which it should be, given that it was 20,000 for uh, the date, so it should be a huge number. Date that you asked for is 1. Okay. Why is it 1? Because 2nd January 1960 is 1. 1st 1, January 1960 is 0. So anything after that will be incremented in the number of days that have elapsed. So 3rd January will be 2, so on and so forth. Right? So this value will come up as a number. We have not formatted it yet. We are not giving it as a, a human readable date format. So it will come up as a number. But have a look at this variable, date as string. It is coming up at 2nd January 1960. But do you think this is a date? Have a look at my screen and tell me if it is a date. Okay, so Hema has a question. Why is there a dot at the end? Is it the format syntax? Yes, it is. Yes, so the format has to end with a dot, with a period. So guys, my question is, this variable called date as string, is it a date type of variable or a string or a number? What is it? Yes, absolutely. So Hema has got it correctly and the, all the other people should also follow closely by looking at the proc contents output okay the proc content has three variables date time you asked for date you asked for and date as string so date time you asked for is a number which is fine date you asked for is also a number but date as string was a character why because there was no date constant as a, a, a concatenated with it i mean you have to give a d to tell the sas system that this is a date value that I'm providing to this variable. If you don't give it, it will take it as a string. I mean, it's a perfectly valid string. There's no problem. But you cannot do date operations on this string. It is a plain string. You can do character type of operations on top of it. So this is the difference between providing a date constant or a date time constant to the SAS system and providing a string to the SAS system. You have to be careful what you are providing the value for. Okay. So let us go ahead and see some functions for dates. So I uh, have a look at this code. In this, I am reading the name from first four columns. And then from the sixth column, I'm reading the birthday, which is having a date form of MMDDYY11 dot. And then I'm calculating the month out of it. I'm, I'm picking out the month out of it, the day out of it, the year out of it, the weekday out of it, and the quarter of it. So these are all predefined functions in SAS. See, everything is there available for you. Just feed in the date and ask what you need to be calculated and just just say I want the weekday or the day or the month. So I'll go ahead and run this. So while the code is executing, do you follow how we are reading the data from data lines? Are you able to understand how, how it is reading from the data lines? Come on, let me know if there is any challenge <laughs> okay, so Kiran says almost. So, which part is uh, you are not able to follow? So, the the input statement. I think start from this. You should be able to follow it perfectly. The name is being read first, so this is the name. And from the sixth column, see, I've placed my cursor on the sixth column, and at the bottom of the screen, you can say there is a 6 appearing here. So this is the row column uh, cursor orientation. So from the 6th column, you'll read the birthday and it will be a MMDDYY11 dot. This is the birthday that it has read. So 1st January 1960, 1955 and so on and so forth. And then what is the month for this birthday? So see carefully. So month is 1st January. So month will be 1. For July, it will be 7. For July it will be 7, November 11, June 6. What was the day of that month? First, 11, 11. Yes, it, 
so Kiran has a question, can the input dates have any separator? That's true. It can read the dates irrespective of what separator you are providing it, but the format has to be appropriate, so it will be able to read it. It doesn't worry about the separator. Okay, so this is the day of the month and this is the year. And then if you talk about the weekday and the quarter, the weekday is 6. The week starts from Sunday for SAS. So if I show you the calendar, you should always go ahead and check out things for yourself. Okay, so 1960, if I go to 1st January, it was a Friday. So the weekday is 6th, that means 7th would be Saturday and the week will start with Sunday. Okay, so this is how these functions can be applied on the dates and they can give you the corresponding month, day, year or weekday or quarter, whatever you require from that date, you can extract it. It's very handy, it works very nicely, I mean you can apply it anywhere and you can get the output from it. So now I'm moving on to a slightly complex calculations for dates. I want you to follow closely and don't worry if you're not able to pick up the entire uh, content right now because I know uh, if you don't have a, a, a kind of beginner background it, it would be slightly heavy on you but try to uh, follow what I'm telling you as of now and uh, if you are able to follow it you can always uh, build upon it you can always uh, practice it and get comfortable with it right so we'll follow this data step closely what we are trying to do and uh, how it is being done so we are trying to read a character type of variable called subject from 1 to 4 columns then the last name from 18 to 23 then the weight from 30 to 32 and then after weight leave one column and read the weight date see i am deliberately giving all sorts of variations in reading data from data lines because uh, if you want to test out your uh, functions if you want to test out some features in sas uh, it's always handy to put in some data lines and start running your code and see how the output comes up so if you need a lengthy a character type of variable called subject from last name from 18 to 23 then the weight from 30 to 32 one to four columns then the last and then after weight leave one column and read the weight deliberately giving all sorts of variations in reading date see i am data from data lines because uh, if you want to test out your uh, functions if you want to test out some features in sas uh, it's always hand what we are trying to do and lines and start running your need to put in some data so put and see how the output comes up if you need a lengthy a character type of variable called subject from last name from 18 to 23 then the weight from 30 to 32 and then after weight leave one to four columns then the last deliberately giving all sorts of variations in reading d1 column and read the weight data from data lines because date see i am if you want to test out your uh, functions if you want to test out some features in sas uh, it's always hand what we are trying to do and lines and start running your uh, so i need to put in some data if you need a uh, code and see how the output comes up. A uh, character type of variable, lengthy last name from 18 to 23, variable called subject from B, then the weight from 30 to 32, one to four columns, then the last, deliberately giving all sorts of variations in reading D1 column and read the weight data from data lines because date, see, I am, if you want to test out, and then after weight uh, functions, if you want to put your uh, as, uh, it's always hashed out some features in cell lines and start running your code. what we are trying to do and so uh, need to put in some data if you need a uh, code and see how the output comes up a uh, character type of variable. lengthy last name from 18 to 23 label called subject from B, then the weight from 30 to 32 one to four columns then the last of variations in reading deliberately giving all sort of data from data lines because see one column and read the weight if you want to test out it see I am uh, functions if you want to do and then after weight last uh, it's always hand out your uh, lines and test out some features in what we are trying to do and so I need to put in some data if you need a, a character type of variable and see how the output comes up last name from 18 to 23 uh, 
lengthy table called subject from then the weight from 30 to 32 one to four columns then the lots of variations in reading data from data lines because see one column and read the weight if you want to test out it see I am deliberately giving all sort of and then after weight less uh, it's always have uh, functions if you want to test lines and start running your code your uh, test out some features in cell. what we are trying to do and uh, need to put in some data if you need a, a character type of weight and see how the output comes up last name from 18 to 23 lengthy then the weight from 30 to 32 one to four columns then the last of variations in reading data from data lines because see one column and read the weight date see I am if you want to test out deliberately giving all sort of and then after weight less uh, it's always have functions if you want to test lines and start running your put your uh, test out some features in cell. what we are trying to do and uh, need to put in some data if you need a, a character type of weight and see how the output comes up table called subject from 18 to 23 so then the weight from 30 to 32 lengthy one to four columns then the last data from data lines because of variations in reading date see I am if you want to test out deliberately giving all sort of and then after weight less uh, it's always have uh, functions if you want to put your uh, test out some features in cell lines and start running your code. what we are trying to do and need to put in some data if you need a, a character type of weight and see how the output comes up last name from 18 to 23 so then the weight from 30 to 32 uh, lengthy data from data lines because one to four columns then the last table called subject from date see I am if you want to test out deliberately giving all sort of and then after weight less uh, it's always has of variations in reading put your uh, functions if you want to test lines and start running your test out some features in cell what we are trying to do and need to put in some data if you need a, a character type of weight and see how the output comes up last name from 18 to 23 so then the weight from 30 to 32 lengthy data from data lines because one to four columns then the last table called subject from date see I am deliberately giving all sort of and then after weight less uh, it's always has of variations in reading put your uh, if you want to test out what we are trying to do and test out some features in send to put in some data if you need a, a character type of weight and see how the output comes up lines and start running your code. lengthy data from data lines because one to four columns then the last date see I am table called subject from who and then after weight deliberately giving all sorts of variations in reading as uh, it's always had your uh, then the weight from 30 to 32 if you want to test out what we are trying to do and test out some features in send to put in some data if you need a uh, and see how the output comes up a uh, character type of lines and start running your code. lengthy data from data lines because one to four columns eight see I am table called subject from who and then after weight deliberately giving all sorts of variations in reading as uh, it's always high than the weight from 30 to 32 if you want to test out test out some features in cell what we are trying to do and if you need uh, need to put in some data out your uh, and see how the output comes up lines and start running your uh, character type of uh, lengthy data from data lines because one to four columns then the last eight see I am table called subject from who and then after weight deliberately giving all sorts of variations in reading as uh, it's always had if you want to test out test out some features in cell then the weight from 30 to 32 if you need uh, what we are trying to do and put your uh, need to put in some data out and see how the output comes up lines and start running your uh, character type of
one to four columns, then the last eight. See, I am label called subject from who, and then after wait, deliberately giving all sorts of variations in reading as uh, it's always hand. If you want to test out, test out some features in SAS. If you need, uh, then the wait from 30 to 32. Put your uh, need to put in some data code and see how the output comes up. Lines and start running your. Uh, character type of variable. one to four columns then the last label called subject from who and then after wait deliberately giving all sorts of variations in reading as uh, it's always hand if you want to test out test out some features in SAS. if you need a uh, date see I am put your uh, need to put in some data code and see how the output comes up then the wait from 30 to 32 lines and start running your a uh, character type of variable. one to four columns then the last label called subject from two, and then after wait lists of variations in reading as uh, it's always hand deliberately giving all sorts if you want to test out if you need a uh, date see I am put your uh, test out some features and send it to put in some data then the wait from 30 to 32 lines and start running your code and see how the output comes up. A character type of variable. one to four columns then the last label called subject from as uh, it's always hands of variations in reading deliberately giving all sorts if you want to test out if you need a uh, date see I am Test out some features in set your uh, need to put in some data then the wait from 30 to 32 and then after wait lines and start running your code and see how the output comes up. A uh, character type of variable. one to four columns then the last label called subject from as uh, it's always hands of variations in reading. Deliberately giving all sorts. If you need, uh, if you want to test out, test out some features in set your uh, need to put in some data. Then the wait from 30 to 32 lines and start running your code. And then after wait, code and see how the output comes up. A uh, character type of variable called subject from as uh, it's always hand. If you want to test out, test out some features in send to put in some data, then the wait from 30 to 32 lines and start running your code. And then after wait, load and see how the output comes up. A character type of variable called subject from as uh, it's always hand. If you want to test out, need to put in some data, then the wait from 30 to 32 lines and start running your test out some features in set and see how the output comes up. A character type of variable called subject from as uh, it's always hand. If you want to test out, need to put in some data lines and start running your test out some features in set and see how the output comes up. A character type of variable called subject from as uh, it's always hand. Need to put in some data if you want to. Test out lines and start running your code. Test out some features in set code and see how the output comes up. A character type of variable called subject from as uh, it's always hand.
and you to put in some data lines and start running your code. test out some features in code and see how the output comes up and, uh, character type of it if you want to test out as uh, it's always handleable called subject from need to put in some data lines and start running your code. test out some features in code and see how the output comes up and, uh, character type of it if you want to test out as uh, it's always handleable called subject from Need to put in some data lines and start running your code. code and see how the output comes up. And, uh, character type of it. If you want to test out, variable called subject from as uh, it's always handy. to put in some data lines and start running your code. code and see how the output comes up and, uh, character type of it if you want to test out label called subject from as uh, it's always handy to put in some data lines and start running your code. code and see how the output comes up and, uh, character type of it if you want to test out label called subject from as uh, it's always handy to put in some data lines and start running your code and see how the output comes up if you want to test out label called subject from as uh, it's always handy to put in some data lines and start running your code and see how the output comes up if you want to test out label called subject from as uh, it's always handy to put in some data lines and start running your code and see how the output comes up if you want to test out table called subject from as uh, it's always handy to put in some data code and see how the output comes up if you want to test out table called subject from 
as uh, it's always handy to put in some data and see how the output comes up. If you want to test out a table called subject from as uh, it's always handy to put in some data and see how the output comes up. If you want to test out to put in some data as uh, it's always hand and see how the output comes up if you want to test out and to put in some data as uh, it's always hand put and see how the output comes up if you want to test out and to put in some data and see how the output comes up if you want to test out and to put in some data as uh, it's always hand put and see how the output comes up if you want to test out and to put in some data as uh, it's always hand and see how the output comes up if you want to test out and to put in some data as uh, it's always hand and see how the output comes up if you want to test out and to put in some data as uh, it's always hand and see how the output comes up if you want to test out and to put in some data and see how the output comes up if you want to test out to put in some data put 
output and see how the output comes up. If you want to test out to put in some data code and see how the output comes up. If you want to test out to put in some data and see how the output comes up. Curiosity and inquisitiveness and you will champion this concept. Okay. So we'll now use the INT CK and INT NX function in conjugation to see how you can manipulate the dates and bring out stunning results. Okay, so this is a data step where we have read the weight date, the, uh, one weight date, two birth date, and everything. So the year difference is used to calculate the age. Again, the INT CK is also used to create the age to calculate the age because the interval would be an year see see the comparison between these two functions so the interval is an year if we try to calculate how many years how many intervals have elapsed it will show me the age of that person similarly the days difference if I say the interval is a day it will show me how many days have elapsed so these these two values should come exact replica of each other okay let me run this all and you'll be able to understand what intervals we are talking about in INTCK and INTNX. So the output says for the age year difference it is a decimal because it is calculating it as a year difference for the interval for the boundaries it has crossed it will never be a decimal. So this is the difference that you will see. So if you want a whole number age you simply do a INTCK and it will give you a whole number age. If you want the exact precise age you do a year difference you will get the age the difference as a decimal number. Are you able to understand the difference? Okay. Usually you require the whole number age and then you provide this age. So this is not a decimal because you'd never cross a boundary in decimals. Either you cross the boundary or you don't cross the boundary. Either a year has gone by or it has not gone by. There cannot be a 1.5 year gone by. There can be a one year, there can be a two year, three year, four year and so on. So a boundary can be crossed only integral number of times. Hence the value will be an integer. However, the year difference can be a floating point number and it will come up as a floating point number. Similarly for days difference since it is a day is a atomic unit of difference between two dates you can say it. So it will not come up as a fraction it will come up as a whole number and the days from INTCK and the days from date difference will be exactly the same. So my intention is to show you how the results tally with what you are trying to do and how they match your expectations. Okay, So this brings us to the next module, uh, the next section of this module which is uh, put and input date. So these are the for these are the dates uh, operations that you will do in the SAS studio and you can work on that. So format is I think we don't need to discuss it now because we have already discussed so many formats. So you can quickly see this. Okay, Follow these formats we have already used it a lot in most of our codes. Similarly, there are in formats to read the data into the SAS system. This I have mentioned already. So uh, I'll be sharing some sample codes with you as well so that you get a feel of how we are progressing in this and you can quickly refer it back. Okay. So this brings us to the put and input functions. Now this is these are important functions. Follow carefully and you will be able to convert data types from numer numbers to characters and characters to numbers. And this is a frequent conversion that you might need to do depending upon what kind of data you're getting from the source system. right? So the put function can accept a numeric argument or a character argument but will always uh, push character type of output. 
it will always print character type of output. There is no exception to it. However, if you talk about the input function, if you, it will always accept a character type of input, and it can provide a character type of output as well as a number type of output. Okay, so this is the main difference between these two functions. And depending upon your use case, you need to use them judiciously as to how to use them. Okay, so I'll show you this data step. So in this, there is a build day variable, which is a numeric variable, which has value 15. Then there is a build date variable, which is a string. Okay, and now I'm printing the build day as a hexadecimal number. So 15 in hexadecimal notation, what value does it become? Guys, what value does it become? 15 in hexadecimal, uh, if, you, if you know the hexadecimal number system. So you all know, uh, if, if you have read the hexadecimal number system, 9 is up till what it follows in decimal, and then from 0 to 15, it goes from A, B, C, D till F. So it should be an F, OK? This is the format in which it will print it out. And input is will take the build date, because it's a character input, and print it out as a number. So if I try to print it out, OK? Let us see what the results are. So build date is a character, and build day is a number, which is fine. The CC date is a number, and the CC hexadecimal is a character. Why? Because put will always print it out as a character, OK? But CC date was being read by input function, and it can either be a number or a character, but it will always print out as a it, it, it has to be a character that it has to read, but it can be a character or a number. In this case, the format that is provided is date 9, so it will be a number. OK? Is it clear? See, see the differences between these functions. It can read, put can read character or number, any kind of variable, and will always print out a character. Right? So this part is done. Input will always read a character type of variable. Now you will say, oh, what if I make a number read to it. So let me show you how it will behave if you make a number being read into it. OK? Now trying to run this code and follow the log. So CCC data is missing now. Because if you follow the log, it was expecting as a, a character to be read into the input function, but it says numeric values have been converted to character values at the places given by 104 to column 14. So this is the precise location of your problem. So it has come up as a note, but you need to understand that it is an issue with your code. Right? That is what I was talking about. Even a note can cause havoc in your code. So you have to follow closely what your log is saying. So Hema has a question, uh, what is the difference between put, input, and format? So these are the functions. Put and input are the functions, and they use formats to determine what your values that your output will be look like. Okay? So in this case, you want your output value to be a hexadecimal number. In this case, you want your output value to be a date 9 uh, value. So these are the formats. So format is anything, any structure that you apply to a value and instruct the SAS system to display the value in that structure, broadly speaking. This is what a format is. And an in format is also the same thing, but it is an instruction to the SAS system to read that value in that format. Okay, to read that value in that structure. It is being read into the SAS system. Okay, so l let me show you uh, some options f for the data set as well. So put and input are very interesting functions. You should use them in your code frequently. You should try to switch values from numeric to character and character to numeric and see how they behave. So this brings us to the conditional execution. Uh, I'll be walking you through some if-then-else codes, uh, discuss some nuances that happen. So let me show you a simple conditional execution. I am going to print this. Uh, I'm going to run this code and print, uh, give you the print of uh, the output of this code. But there is a logical error in this code, and you have to tell me what is the error. So I'll, I'll quickly show you what, what is happening. So I have a variable called losses. It has a value 800. Uh, now I'm trying to categorize uh, a variable called group, 
depending upon what is the value of losses. So if losses is less than or equal to 10, group will be very, very, very less loss incurred. If it is greater than or equal to 11 in this range, it will be some loss greater than this and less than this, this range, loss incurred and greater than or equal to this, huge loss incurred. Else, there is no loss incurred, okay? Now, there is a value of 800 assigned to losses and ideally, my output should be loss incurred because it falls in this range, right? I'm going to run this code and let us see if the output matches our expectations. Now I am trying to showcase logical errors in your code. This code is absolutely fine syntactically. There is no problem at all. But your output won't match your expectations. See, don't worry about the title. It has come from the previous ones. But the output is loss is 800 and the group is no loss in cut. How did this happen? Why did this happen? Anybody? Come on, it's a, it's a very commonsensical uh, approach. If you have done any programming in any language, you might have, there is a possibility you might have seen this problem, this issue. This is a logical issue. Your code is fine. Everything is correct. I mean, as a human being, if I do the dry run, it should work fine. But there is a catch. It doesn't work. Come on, guys. We are almost there. Okay? So just rack your brains and quickly think about why the group value was no loss incurred rather than a value of loss incurred. Why did this happen? Kiran, Hema, Peter. Hema, I'm not sure I understood your answer. Uh, I mean, all the if statements will be terminated by a semicolon. You have to provide every single if statement will be terminated by a semicolon. There is no continuity in SAS. You have to give a statement, terminate with a semicolon, begin the next statement, terminate with a semicolon, and so on. So syntactically, this code is absolutely fine. So, Brad, Kuldeep, any any idea why this is happening? There is a else. There is a else, right? And that's where the group was assigned, no loss occurred. Okay. So let me walk you through this code and tell you what is the logical flaw in this. See carefully. And this is this not only pertains to SAS, this pertains to a broader level of programming logic that you will apply elsewhere, everywhere in your life. Okay. There is a variable called losses. It has a value of 800. Then there are categories here. What happens is when it reaches this, if the value is satisfied, the group value does become loss incurred. But when it reaches to the next if statement, this is false and it thinks that this else is corresponding to this if and it overrides the value of group to no loss occurred. Does this make sense? Guys, yes or no? Does this make sense? Is it clear to everyone? This is a very fundamental programming flaw. You should always be careful. Okay, I'll repeat. Uh, when we said loss is equal to 800 and we started the if conditional execution started, it started looking for the category and it found that this category was true, the value of group was loss incurred. Actually, the value of group was loss incurred. The loss incurred string was assigned to the variable group. But when it went to the next if statement, this was a false statement and it thought, the SAS system thought that this else correspond to this if statement. If the if is false, the else gets default executed. Okay? And hence, it was overwritten by no loss occurred. So even if there was a loss of 800, the final output came out to be no loss incurred. How do you fix these errors? The straightforward approach is using an if else. Okay? Using an if, if, else, if. So else if has the beauty of making sure that only one condition will be executed, whichever is true. Otherwise, the else will be executed. If any of these conditions is met, it will never reach the else. It will come out of the if-else block altogether. Okay? So, I want to show you this code. What it is doing is, it is trying to check the losses and then categorize them. So I'll show you a code where we are also considering some observations as well. So okay. So before that, I'll show you how to use the do and block to execute multiple statements when you're trying to do that in a SAS code. So 
I'll what I'll do is I'll remove this do block and end block and then I'll run this code so quickly have a look at this data step this corresponds to the input loss data set that I created from the insurance claims uh, file yesterday and if the fuel type is P and the loss is greater than 400 then you there are two variables that need to be set to yes otherwise there are two variables that need to be set to no and then I'll print this value have a look at the output I am trying to share why do we need a do end block okay in, if I do have a do end block but in the else I don't have any do end block so what might be the issue if it happens if this was a single statement everything would have worked fine but we need a block of statements to be executed so as you know every semicolon constitutes one statement it holds one statement in itself so one statement is this one statement is this and so on and so forth so even if there was a value of fuel type SP and losses greater than 400 the check service history is still no and the call RTO is still no why did it happen because though it got assigned to yes okay but since there is a no there is a there is a no do end block here so it will just come here and it will say this is where the else ends and it will assign the value of call RTO to no okay so in order to make multiple statements execute in a block you need to use a do end block in your data step something like this so you have to define what will be the block and then mention all the statements inside that block okay so this was a P and this the loss was greater than 400 so the check service history and the call RTU will be yes this is what we wanted right so are you getting this point and this brings us to the last topic of our today's session which will be subsetting the data sets cutting them horizontally and vertically and keeping and dropping variables yeah but Kiran has a question but there was another end yeah so there was only a do end inside the if statement right for the else statement what I'm trying to say is if you don't give a do and block only the first statement will be considered and rest all will be thought as being part of the entire data step so they will be overwritten the values will be overwritten does it make sense great so be careful about that if you want multiple statements to be executed in one go enclose them in a do and block the way I have done it if this is this then do semicolon write down all the statements that you want to be executed terminate it with the end if you leave the end the compiler will cry for end uh, didn't find a matching end for a do so it will tell you you put an end and then mention all your statements inside the do and block okay so now we are into the last step of this uh, session where we will be seeing how do we subset the data set when we say subset the data set we mean we are trying to cut the data horizontally we are trying to filter the observations it's, it's just a technical term to, to, to a simple process called filtering the observations you want to filter it depending upon something okay and how do you do that a simple and the most simple approach is data you set the data set and you write the output data set and then simply say if losses is greater than 1200 this is a completely valid and syntactically correct SAS program okay now I'll show you how it what output will generate and you'll be able to understand what it is doing so when I say it is subsetting the data set it is subsetting this data set provided on the set statement and generating the output data set called output dot subset okay have a look at this my condition was if the losses is greater than 1200 only then consider the observations to be written to the output data cell called subset okay so the number of observations that were read from the output from the input dot input underscore loss data set was 1529 but the ones which match were only 156 and hence my output data set will contain only 156 observations this is a simple subsetting of a data set okay now suppose 
I need to subset my data set and write to multiple output data sets. So I can do that again. And how do I do that? I'll show you this data step first. So data output data set one, output data set two. The num the data sets that you are planning to write to will be mentioned in your data step and you have to mention them compulsorily in your data statement as well. The code will fail if it doesn't see the data set name on the data st statement. It has to be there. Okay. And then you say if loss is greater than 1200, you want to output the observations to this data set. You read the statement like this. If loss is greater than 1200, then output more than 1200. So this is the data set name. This is what you are trying to do. Why did output why was it not required here? The simple reason is there is only one data set to write to. Right? And output is implicit here. If you write like this, it is implicitly understood by SAS system that you want to output it to the output data set. Right? So these are some subtleties. You have to uh, consider them when you are running your code. So when I ran this code, there were again 15,289 observations considered from the input data set, 156 were written to this, and 384 were written to the other data set. So you can create multiple data sets out of a single data set. Okay. And this brings us to keeping and dropping and renaming variables. So it is a rather simple process. You just need to keep in mind the efficiency gains or the performance gains that you will have. So if you, you can do it in two ways. You can keep the variables like this, set input data set, keep these variables and write it to this data set or you can set this data set, write this data set and then say keep is equal to age. Now this is a keep statement and this is a keep data set option. Understand the difference. There is a keep statement and then there is a keep data set option. Now the question that should come to your mind is when do I use which, right? And the answer is judiciously use the, st the options and always keep in mind the performance gains, the efficiency gains. Can you tell me which of these is a more efficient data step out of this and this and why? Come on, this is the last question I'm asking. Don't worry. I won't ask any more questions. <laughs> so if I say this is data step A or say keep variable and then keep again, which of these is a better performing data step? Think about, uh, think on those lines as well. I mean, you can do the same thing in a different, in a lot of different ways, but the one that you should pick should suit your requirement and should have some performance gain as well. I mean, if there is no hard and fast requirement that it has to be done in a more uh, dragging way, you should always think about performance gain. So see the difference and then you will quickly understand which one is better. No, Hima, uh, that's not better and I'll tell you why. So see the first one, you're setting an input data set and then saying keep only these three variables. The PDB will immediately come to know only these three variables need to be kept and it will write only these three variables to the output data set, right? But in the second data step, you're saying set all the variables and let the PDB write all the variables to this output data set and then flag these three variables to be kept and delete all the rest. So there is a performance gain in the first one. You're already filtering out the variables from the input data set and that is what you should target. If you if you don't require any observation, any variable or any data in your data set, drop it, delete it there and then. Don't take it forward to any further steps. Okay? Does it make sense? Okay? So the first one is the way to go because it it is performance wise superior to the second one. So uh, I already told you yesterday about the first ops and ops ob, uh, uh, data set options. So ops means till this observation. So if I'm saying proc print data key variable ops 5, it means I want to print till fifth observation. And no ops means I don't want to print the serial numbers that come with the proc print. Okay. And then how do we rename uh, the variables? It's a simple process. Rename is equal to the old variable is equal to the new variable. So if I do this and I print it out, the variable called losses in my data set will be renamed to losses incurred. So this is how renaming is done. Okay. So if you see the output, still not refreshed. 
yeah, it's refreshed. Losses incurred, so it has changed. So this is pretty much what we had to cover today. Uh, I hope you have caught the gist of functions and you understand how to write small codes and see the output, figure out if, uh, if it is matching your expectations. And if not, go back to the log, see the log, follow the notes coming up and uh, fix your code if required. Otherwise, if the output is good enough, there's no problem at all. So we'll stop here. And uh, guys, just one request to everyone. Uh, you'll get a small feedback at the end of this class. Please make sure you submit that feedback. It takes hardly 10, 15 seconds. Uh, it is very critical for us as a team to understand how we are doing and how better we can do to uh, match your expectations. Okay. I thank you all for this uh, session, and uh, we'll meet next week again. Okay. Thank you.